Welcome to Concept in Medicine. In today's tutorial, we are going to be looking at the types of heart failure. Let's begin by looking at the first classification. That is going to be based on the phase of the cardiac cycle. We will start by looking at the systolic heart failure and the diastolic heart failure. So for the systolic heart failure, we will say that it is said to occur when the heart fails to contract to meet the body's metabolic demand. And for that, the ejection fraction is less than 40%. And because of that, the systolic heart failure is referred to as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, written as HFREF. Let's move ahead and look at the causes of the systolic heart failure. With that, we'll use an easy mnemonic we call the my square half, the my square half. So with that, we are talking about myocardial infarction. We are talking about ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathics, which could be peripatum cardiomyopathy, an example. The A is the hypertension. The A, arrhythmias, which arrhythmias? We are looking at ventricular tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardias. Then the V, we are talking about valvular heart disease with that. It could be a stenosis and also be a regurgitation. Let's move ahead and look at the diastolic heart failure. With the diastolic heart failure, we will say that it is said to occur when the heart fails to relax, resulting in elevated feeling pressures. And when it happens as such, you would see the ejection fraction becoming greater than or equal to 50%. Hence, the diastolic heart failure can be referred to as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. All right, let's move ahead and look at the causes. For the causes, we will use another easy mnemonic we call the curve. That's a C square O-R-V, curve. With the curve, we are looking at the first one, constrictive pericarditis. The next one, cardiac tamponade, obesity, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and ventricular hypertrophy. All right, let's move ahead and look at the other criteria of the classification. So the next one is going to be based on the onset. With the onset, we are looking at an acute versus a chronic heart failure. So what is the acute heart failure we are talking about? When we talk about acute heart failure, you should know that it is a new term used to exclusively describe a new onset heart failure or a sudden decomposition of an existing chronic heart failure. And if it is used to describe a sudden decomposition of an existing chronic heart failure, then we'll call that acute on chronic heart failure. And for the acute heart failure in general, it is characterized by peripheral or pulmonary edema with or without signs of peripheral hypoperfusion. Let's move ahead and talk about the chronic heart failure. When we talk about the chronic heart failure, we are looking at a term used to describe a gradual onset of heart failure with slow progression. Let's move on and look at the next criteria of the classification. And the next criteria is going to be based on the ejection fraction. When we are talking about ejection fraction, we are looking at the fraction of blood that is ejected from the left ventricle in relation to the total amount of blood in the left ventricle at the end of diastole. And for the normal ejection fraction, it is equivalent to 60 to 80 percent. And based on that, we have three types of heart failure. The first one is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which we initially related to the diastolic heart failure. And for the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the ejection fraction is greater than or equal to 50 percent. The next one is the heart failure with mid-range or mildly reduced ejection fraction. For that, the ejection fraction is equal to 40 to 49%. Then finally, we are talking about heart failure 
with reduced ejection fraction, which we previously related to the systolic heart failure. And for that, the ejection fraction is less than 40%. And for each of the three types of heart failure we written with relation to the ejection fraction, they are typically written as such. So take note of the way they are written. Let's move ahead and look at the next criteria of classification. And that next criteria of classification is going to be based on the cardiac output where we are going to be talking about the low output heart failure and the high output heart failure. When we talk about the low output heart failure, it is said to occur when the cardiac output is low and fails to increase normally with exertion. It means that when there is demand for more oxygenated blood, the heart will fail to or increase its cardiac output to meet the demand. That's what we call the low output cardiac failure. And you should know that the low output cardiac failure is more common as compared to the high output cardiac failure. Let's move ahead and look at the causes of the low output cardiac failure. For the causes, we are going to group them into three. The first group will be the excessive preload. The next group will be pump failure. And the final group will be chronic excessive afterload. So with that, when we say preload, what are we talking about? When we talk about preload, it is the volume of blood in the left ventricle at the end of diastole. Because of that, the preload is also referred to as the end diastolic volume. The end diastolic volume. The preload is also referred to as the end diastolic volume. So let's move ahead and talk about the causes with regards to excessive preload. With regards to excessive preload, we can talk in direction of a mitral regurgitation. We can also talk in the direction of fluid overload. And under that, we are looking at renal failure, which can cause fluid overload, and also rapid intravenous infusion, which can also cause fluid overload. Let's move ahead and look at the second group of causes. That is the pump failure. What to make the pump to fail? The first one is we are looking at the systolic and or diastolic heart failure. So meaning that systolic heart failure can give rise to a pump failure and diastolic heart failure can also give rise to a pump failure. Then, reduce heart rate. With a reduced heart rate, we are talking about what can make the heart rate to go so low. And in that case, heart blocks, yes, first, second, third degree heart blocks, yes, they can cause the heart rate to be low and that can affect the pumping ability of the heart. We can also talk about the beta blockers. You know, beta 1 receptors on the heart causes the heart to beat to what? Give us an increased heart rate. But in the case where beta blockers are given, they would what? Decrease the beta 1 activity and that will reduce the heart rate. Then the next one, we are talking about post myocardial infarction, post MI. When the cardiomyocytes are necrotic, are infected, are dead, definitely the function of contraction will become impaired and that will give rise to a uh, heart rate being low. And finally, negatively ionotropic drugs. When we say ionotropy, it basically any agent that increases the contraction of the heart or the force of contraction of the heart. And if that is negative, it means that agent is decreasing the force of contraction of the heart or the contractility of the heart and that could give rise to a low heart rate. Then the last group of the causes, we are talking about chronic excessive afterload, chronic excessive afterload. But before we look at those causes, let's know what an afterload is. When we are talking about afterload, then let's take this at the left atrium, left ventricle, and the aorta. And we know that the aorta is the outlet of the left ventricle. That is the vessel through which the left ventricle pumps blood out of each chamber. So with that, when we say afterload, we are talking in relation to the left ventricle. How much pressure the left ventricle must overcome to be able to pump blood into the systemic circulation via the aorta. And if you are talking about excessive afterload, chronic excessive afterload, it means that the pressure the left ventricle must overcome is great. And the question is, what can make the pressure the left ventricle must overcome goes high? If the outlet of 
the left ventricle becomes narrow and in that case we are looking at the aortic valve becoming narrow so in that case we are talking about aortic stenosis if there's aortic stenosis it means the left ventricle would have to do more work to be able to overcome the resistance that would be provided for by the aortic stenosis so the first cause under that would be what aortic stenosis then the second one is if the pressure in the system is very high then that creates a greater resistance to which the left ventricle must overcome to be able to pump blood through the aorta into the systemic circulation so in that the next cause under the chronic excessive afterload will be systemic hypertension so in all we are saying that the afterload is the pressure or resistance the left ventricle must overcome so as to pump blood into the systemic circulation via the aorta let's move on and look at the high output cardiac failure the high output heart failure with the high output heart failure we will say that it is said to occur when the cardiac output is normal or high in the face of increasing needs but fails to meet the body's metabolic demands that is the high output heart failure and for the high output heart failure it is less common as compared to the low output cardiac failure and for the causes of the high output heart failure think of the hyperkinetic scenarios hyperkinetic conditions and with that we are talking about a neat acronym we call the PAT pub the PAT pub with the PAT pub we are talking about pregnancy we are talking about anemia we are talking about thyrotoxicosis we are also talking about Paget's disease of the bone we are talking about arteriovenous malformations or fistulas and we are, we are also talking about beriberi that's a wet beriberi of the heart which is a vitamin b1 deficiency that is timing deficiency and lastly with the high output heart failure you should know that it is characterized by the features of the right ventricular failure followed later by the evidence of the left ventricular failure features let's move ahead and look at the last criteria of the classification that will be based on the location of the dysfunction and based on the location of the dysfunction we can talk about left ventricular failure the right ventricular failure and congestive cardiac failure let's move ahead and talk about left ventricular failure for the left ventricular failure it means that there is dysfunction of the left ventricle such that the left ventricle fails to pump blood commensurate with the body's metabolic requirement and with that the causes we can think of using an acronym we call the scam v with the scam v we are talking about systolic hypertension which is the most common cause of left ventricular heart failure the left ventricular failure the most common cause of left ventricular failure is systolic the most common cause of left ventricular failure is systemic hypertension the next one we are talking about cardiomyopathies the next one hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy we can also talk about aortic stenosis arrhythmias such as supraventricular tachycardia the ventricular tachycardias we can move ahead and talk about myocardial infections then finally valvular heart disease such as uh, the regurgitations and the stenosis and also you should know that the left ventricular failure is what is subdivided into the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction heart failure with mid-range or mildly reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction which we spoke about previously let's move ahead and talk about the right ventricular failure in the same way we are talking about the right ventricle having a dysfunction such that it is unable to pump venous blood efficiently into the lungs for oxygenation to take place so with that for the causes we can use the mnemonic l p square cm and with that the first one we are talking about left ventricular failure and you should know that left ventricular failure is the most common cause of right ventricular failure and if you are having a left ventricular failure being 
a cause of right ventricular failure it means that in that scenario we can boldly see that what is happening is a coexistence of left ventricular failure and right ventricular failure hence we'll call it a biventricular failure or congestive cardiac failure the other cause is pulmonary hypertension pulmonary stenosis we can also talk about cardiomyopathies and finally myocardial infarction as well and as i already said when you have the left ventricular failure and the right ventricular failure coexisting happening at the same time then we'll call that congestive cardiac failure and why are we calling it congestive cardiac failure because there is going to be conjection in the systemic circulation and also conjection in the pulmonary circulation and these conjections are brought about by the ventricular failures meaning in their respective allocations we will see that the left ventricular failure give rise to the pulmonary conjection and the right ventricular failure gives rise to the systemic conjection meaning if you are taking a left ventricular failure it will give rise to the conjection in the pulmonary circulation and if you are looking at the right ventricular failure to give rise to conjection in the systemic circulation meaning that the two systems of circulation in the human body that is the pulmonary and the systemic are all congested hence the name congestive cardiac failure i believe we've learned a lot of new things today kindly make sure to subscribe to my channel like share and also comment the concept you would like to see in my next video my name is dr Dell, and once again this is concept in medicine bye bye